With a best DT of 569 at 259 mile an hour, Rod Harvey's Toyota Camry is currently the fourth fastest import in the world on ET or quickest I should say, and the third fastest on mile an hour. We're here with Rod at Sydney Jamboree 2020 to find out a little bit about what makes this car so fast. Uh, Rod, for a start I think it's worth saying that you've been doing this for a long time and you've been seeing iterative improvements on the mile an hour, or you know that when you first went into the sixes and then into the fives, and we've seen a, a flood of other competitors come into the five second zone, and for those viewing at home it's important to say it's a massive feat to get there at any stretch anyway, but you're really one of the top competitors all around the world. And you've recently gone to a completely new car to obviously try and go a little bit quicker. So I want to start with that. What's the difference between this new chassis and your old one? Uh, with the Celica, we were probably we got to a point where we were struggling. We'd make a change to the car, and we and we wouldn't see a result. So the idea behind obviously the new car, not only to be lighter, but was just later model technology. Um, obviously, it's more than ten years newer. So we make a change to the four link all the suspension and we see a result and the car accepts the power we're trying to throw at it. It's obviously a pro mod car. The Celica originally was a pro stock car so they were, they were designed to do 200 mile per hour when we brought it and we made it go 253. So you can see why the change was made. So you're starting with a pro mod chassis which is really designed to run these sort of ETs a mile an hour straight straight out the, out the box? Correct. And, and like I say, the car reacts when you do something to it and we can put that much power in it and, and that just helps the whole program. No, it's a pro mod car but you don't have the benefit of a high, large capacity Proline V8 or anything like that with twin turbos. You are running the uh, age old, well proven Toyota 2JZ but you have gone to a billet engine, although a number of years ago. Can you tell us what sort of power level the engine's producing? Uh, to run those sorts of ETs it has to be over 3000. If I was a lot smarter probably I'd put a Proline V8 in it and I wouldn't have to fix it every five minutes but you know um, I'm still passionate about trying to make the six cylinder deal go fast and I've, I've put that much or R and along with my crew and team we put that much R&D into it over the years that, that at this present point I believe we can probably go a little bit better so we'll just keep chipping, it at, chipping away at it while we can. Yeah, you really are right up at the, the forefront of that 2JZ performance whereas yeah, it would be easy as you say to put a, a V8 in it and probably go as quick, maybe even a little bit quicker but you'd be one of a sea of hundreds of do those competitors doing exactly the same thing. Now in terms of the 2JZ engine, with the billet block at the power level you're at, is it safe to assume that the billet block is an essential? Definitely an essential. Um to put that much boost or make it make that much power, definitely a bullet block. I mean, at the moment, um, in the background, we're, we've got to start thinking about bullet heads because they don't actually make these heads anymore for the Toyotas as well, so they're getting thin and uh, we seem to go through them. Uh, just coming back, because you did run for a long time with the cast iron block before you made the jump to, to billet, you're probably not one of the first to go to the billet either, um, and you're still going plenty fast on the, the cast iron block. Where was the, the sort of failure point? What were you breaking on those cast blocks? Really like the, the rear main bearing, would they would just move around in general when you put that much boost or that much power into them. And, and it got to a point where you'd buy a cast block and you might get 20 runs out of it. But the next one you go and buy, you might get three runs out of it. So just the variation just from from one block to another, yeah. and and you never knew what you were going to get, and you're you're trying to stick that much boost or that much power into them, and, and they just keep moving around. So going to the bullet deals definitely help with bearing program and and crankshafts and and. Yeah, it just, it just works and you can't do it without it. I think another thing that's worth mentioning here that most people would probably overlook is driver safety is actually another big factor. If you have uh, an engine let go at 250 mile an hour and you get oil under the slicks or something under the slicks then there's a serious chance that you're going to hurt yourself. So the reliability of the billet block, uh, safety for the driver is a consideration? Oh absolutely, you know I have had cast iron blocks let go and I have driven over my own oil um, more than once and it's no fun you know so you've got to definitely like you say look look at that the, the block that uh, we made ourselves has like actual windows in the side of it so if, if a rod does let go it can come out easily without destroying everything else around it and putting a pull of oil on the ground so to speak. Uh, in terms of the cylinder head you said you've been having some trouble with those so this is still the factory 
cast head or beard, I imagine it's uh, fairly well worked over in-house by you guys before it makes it onto the engine. So where are the limitations with those heads? Well, what I'm finding now is putting as much boost or pressure into the engine as what we are, it does take its toll on the heads, but um, once again, they, they, they're starting to move around and, and the valve seats and, and things like that you know, have trouble staying in there. You, you try and increase the size of the valve and then you have less material to hold onto the seat. Um, so you've got to find a happy mediocre. Um, boost normally fixes most things, so if you can't put a bigger valve in, just put more boost in. It still seems to work, I've worked out. That's a good point, yeah, it's a replacement for displacement for sure. Uh, so you're going to go down the path of developing a CNC billet head for it as well? Oh, I think we need to and we're sort of chipping away on that in the background at the moment. Um, the rules here restrain us from running a bullet block and a bullet head, but we can, um, things are changing, you know, like they'll get to a point where we don't have a choice if we want to keep moving forward or making these things go faster, you know. Yeah, when the world runs out of 2JZ cylinder head castings that are usable, then uh, yeah, you either go bullet or you, you don't race. Uh, obviously the, the whole engine there is really just designed to support the power and remain reliable. It's the turbocharger that's really the key, well, one of the keys to this yeah. whole whole show. So what are you running there? Uh, so it has a Pro Mod, um, either a 106 or 110 on it, depending on what I feel like on the day. Um, we went out the other week and changed some other stuff and I, I put a 106 on it because I knew how consistent I can be with it. Um, it's got a 110 on it for this weekend and I haven't run it that much, so I'm sort of trying to get a handle on a few things. but. It seems to be every time we add more turbo to these cars they go faster but back in the early days when you added a turbo and it was whether it be a 88 and you went to a 94 you saw a big jump and then when you went from a 94 to a 98 or 102 it was a big jump but now once you start getting up around a 102 or 106 or 110 I don't think you see the gains which you saw two or three years ago you know. Now going from a 106 to a 110 we're talking about the, the compressor diameter here and you're, you're essentially saying the 110 millimetre wheel on paper potential for more airflow, so more power, hence you can go faster. Is that a balancing act though where you've still got to get the car to 60 foot and if you can't do that then it doesn't really matter how much power you're making, you might run a, a fast mile an hour but the ET's not going to be there, so how do you balance that? Correct, I mean it's, 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 it's really hard to do obviously um, and the track changes as the day goes on. So. Um, we use obviously boost and timing to control how much we put in the first part of the run. Um, but like, yeah, it is hard to control and, and we're trying to put as much in um, as early as we can because that's what you do when you want to go fast. You can't pussyfoot around, you know. Yeah, I want to talk about getting the boost into it because you are using quite an interesting boost control technique. As straight away it's pretty obvious looking at the exhaust side of the engine, there's no wastegate. So that's conventionally how we control boost by basically leaking the exhaust gas around the turbocharger, controlling the energy available to the turbine wheel. Uh, you're doing it on the other side of the turbo, so can you talk us through how that system works? Uh, it's just an electric, uh, well like a fly-by-wire motor or electric motor, um, creating a leak on the intake side and we control it by the computer by opening or closing it. I believe that if you've got boost you don't want to waste it, so having it on the exhaust also for me, well, used to pose some problems when it first opens. You could never get a real nice, real nice line. It get, you know, so like getting control of the the boost. Yeah. So, so we, over the years, just done what you know. A few other people have done it, and I believe you've probably done it yourself in the early days for for various reasons. But yeah, I just use an electric fly-by-wire motor to control the boost and seem to have a reasonably good handle on it, and try and not waste any boost. We use everything we can as early as we can. So you're actually closing this throttle body some way down the strip, obviously depending on the traction available, and literally that turbo is feeding as much boost as it's going to make? Absolutely. That's and where, what, what sort of numbers are you seeing? Uh, oh, I mean it'll, it'll make 100 pound, um, and yeah, and we try and, as you say, close it depending on the track and get as much in as we can. 
Now coming back, you sort of just talked about with the wastegate boost control, getting good control of that boost in a nice flat line. And I think again, probably for those who aren't familiar with these styles of car, getting a, a consistent launch really requires rock solid RPM and rock solid boost. So you're, you're leaving the line on the hit with the same amount of power and the same RPM every time so the clutch works properly. So is that what you're talking about, the getting the good stable boost control there? Yep, that, that all helps. Like, I mean, with these cars, there's a few things you, you don't have cubic inches on your side and until that turbo makes power or makes boost or however you want to call it, um, trying to control the tyre when you need to control it, you have suddenly, you have no torque basically to start off, unlike a V8 and then when you got it, you got everything. So at that point in the run is normally when you're trying to control the back wheel to get it to 60 and to go to 300 feet. Um, so that's why it's important to have a good handle on all that stuff. 60 to 300 feet, in my mind, everyone might be different, but that's pretty important. After, after then, you're normally, you're normally good to go. If the car's pointing in the right direction, the rest doesn't matter. So really the whole secret to the run is the 60 foot and then the 330 foot. Once, once you're there, you're just a passenger? Pretty much, just hold on at that stage. A, a passenger having a pretty good time? Yeah, yeah, well you're trying to have a good time. But yeah, but that, that, that's how I operate. Hey, everyone might have their own opinion on it or their own idea on it, but it seems to work, you know, for me, so. Yeah, well you, you can't argue that it's definitely working. Uh, getting control of that drive-by-wire throttle for the boost control, as, as with every other aspect of this car, obviously is, is quite involved as well. Can you talk us through the basics of the electronics package on the, on the engine? It's got an M150 MoTeC on it, obviously, um, which in the early days uh, we used to run two M800s to control, back-to-back, -to, -back to control the fly-by-wire motor because we, we didn't have enough to drive it. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, you need a good ECU to do it the way I'm doing it as well. Not, well, most ECUs probably couldn't do what this ECU can do, you know, but it's taken a long time to garner the information, um, which we've just c collated from going, doing laps and going up and down the track to, to, to get it to work the way we like it to work. Uh, uh, for those who aren't familiar with that MoTeC M1 ECU as well, uh, what you're running here, I can only assume, will be a custom firmware package where you can basically have the ability to write your own code to control the engine and the chassis however you want. Is, is that that's how you're running it? Pretty much like so. That that has been written to, to suit what we're doing, but based on what we're doing, they're now selling a package that is based on what we started doing and they've used that to, as a drag package for most people so you could ring up MoTeC tomorrow and, and grab something that can control a fly-by-wire motor. So it's one thing to have the same firmware package that Rod Harvey's running, it's another thing to sort of still go 560s with that package so don't, don't think that that's the whole secret to it. it. It's easy, anyone can do it, just go buy the MoTeC tomorrow. Uh, one more thing I want to talk about here, you're running on methanol fuel, obviously the, the go-to fuel at this sort of level and uh, the ability to run an intercooler or the ability to not run an intercooler, we sort of see a bit of a division amongst drag racers with high boost turbocharged engines. Uh, I notice you're running a, a water to air intercooler here, can you give us your take on the pros and cons of going intercooler versus no intercooler? I've always run an intercooler because I believe that air intake temperatures are really important on, on making the engine live. Yeah. Um, and the, hey, this car's done lap after lap and gone to final after final over the years because I believe the air intake temperature is that important. Now that's once again just my own theory on it and obviously the guys that help me that I'm surrounded with, um, but we've stuck to that program and never really differed from it and I, I think we've achieved or made good gains by, by sticking with it. I think uh, with a lot of things, drag racing no different, you sort of become a little bit superstitious, you try something, it works, if there's no reason to, to change it, you don't, basically the old story, if it isn't broken, don't fix it, is that fair? Very fair. I, I mean, if I told some people what numbers we have on our intake and stuff like that, they probably wouldn't believe me, but it definitely helps, so there's a big enough clue for you. All right, look, yeah, as you say, no doubt it's working. Thanks for the chat there, Rod. It's been great to get some insight into the car. And it's a test day here. Uh, we haven't put in a couple of test passes so far, a few more to go, and obviously we've got racing tomorrow, so we wish you all the best. Look forward to seeing how the car, car goes. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you. If you liked that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week.
And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.